Maniacs, welcome back to the channel, doing another Dead Me Kill Count reaction, and this one is for, I think, one of the most underappreciated remakes of all time. I'm a defender of this movie, Sip of Coffee. And I've always liked it. I remember watching it back in 2010, and I, I remember me and my dad watching it, and I'm a big fan of Anthony Hopkins. I love Hugo Weaving. I, I really, this was my first, this was actually my introduction into Benicio Del Toro, and I really utterly enjoyed it. This was, I, I, I think I saw this one possibly before before I started seeing the original. So uh, I think I like the original one more overall still, but I love the way the Wolfman looks in this movie. I just think it's so badass looking. I don't know what it was. I just, I love it. And I know it won the Academy Award for I think best uh, visual effects or best makeup. So yeah, I, I like it. I like it a lot actually. I like the feel. I thought they captured the time period well. It's the, the remake of The Wolfman from 2010 would be an ACL Del Toro, Anthony Hopkins and everybody like that. I thought it was well done. But I know a lot of people did not like it, and I know a lot of people actually find it to be a bore fest. They don't like the slow burn aspect. It's, it's kind of a slow movie. It builds up to the Wolfman. I mean, the opening is pretty good, but and the CGI here and there is questionable. They could have done better on the CGI. But overall, I thought it was a fun werewolf movie. I, I liked it. Again, I, I repeat myself all the time, so forgive me for that. <laughs> but here we go with the dead meat kill count. Man, if I have to sit back and think about this one, man, there's so many good kills. <laughs> so many good kills. I don't know. We'll have to watch the, uh, the kill count and get uh, refreshed on all what happens in the movie because it's been a while. It's probably been about, like, uh, definitely more than 10 years since I've seen the movie. So here we go with Dead Meat's kill count for The Wolfman 2010. Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're- That's a badass figure back there, man. That's the first thing I noticed. I always look at the guy's background, because just like him, I always change my background up, and I see the, the figure back there. That is dope. Looking at the Wolfman remake from 2010. The Wolfman, now a compound word, came out when the horror genre was dominated by remakes. It's a modern production of the 1941 classic, updated with tons more action and blood, elaborate effects, both practical and digital, and a whole heaping pile of jump scares. It's honestly very good at being a remake. It expands upon the original with- I'm so glad James agrees with me on this one, dude. I was like sitting here worried, oh, he's probably gonna hate it. And he, he just acknowledged it actually does a good job of being a remake. With enough uh. nods to satisfy longtime fans, and spins the material off into a different direction, specifically a father-son feud. For all those strengths though, I still didn't enjoy watching it. I thought Aww. the pace was slow and the performance is disappointing. Anthony Hopkins is bizarrely bad and basically asleep on his feet. Hunt. Holy Mother of God. No, seriously, this may be his worst performance I've ever seen. On the other hand, uh... The wounds were so terrible that only something human would seem capable of such wanton malevolence. Jesus, Tony, at least learn your lines. I can't talk too much shit about the movie, though. Not after learning about its production problems. This one needs a bit of an extra intro. The Wolfman was a massive production that massively failed. It was crapped on by critics and bombed at the box office. The then president of Universal called it one of the worst movies the studio ever made. I don't think it's quite that bad. No. This is the studio that gave us Cat in the Hat, after all. But it was plagued by problems with everything from the director to the the score. Production went over schedule and nearly doubled its budget, which it then failed to recoup in its global gross. The release was moved five times during a year and a half long delay. This thing was a mess is what I'm saying. And yet, it's a fascinating mess, especially from the perspective of how movies are made. The Blu-ray has a great collection of special features that are highly informative for anyone interested in visual effects, makeup effects, stunts, or just filmmaking in general. Check them out. I mean, the movie was literally nominated for Academy Award. It wasn't that big of a, uh, you know, a fucking trash heap. I, I still, still though, man, uh, everything he's saying, I can't argue with. I, I, again, even I said, like, I understand not a lot of people were a fan of the slow pace, and it really does have a slow pace to it. If you're not into slow burn movies, you're not going to enjoy this one because it does have that to it. Um, the CGI, again, is very questionable. It's a little bit messy here and there. The, even even jump scares are a little bit too much sometimes where it's just like you'll just show he, like this this vision of the wolf male will just show up and just like jump in front of the screen and like make you jump uh and i'm not a fan of those kind of things either but like overall man i, I still really enjoyed it I, I guess if you really wanted to go down and break it down i guess you could probably call this one of my guilty pleasures like i'm aware that of all the the issues with it but however i still overall think it's a decent movie i i certainly wouldn't say it's one of universal's worst films and uh this is actually one 
one of his more recent kill counts, I want to say. So, like, this is at the time when things like Transformers, whatever that last piece of shit was, I'm sure it was a bad movie, because most of the Transformers, I haven't even seen it myself, so maybe I'll like it, but most of the Transformers movies, I'm just not a fan of. Uh, and I know Anthony Hopkins was in one of them. And uh, I feel, I, I, I haven't seen every Anthony Hopkins performance to actually go ahead and say this is his worst one. I, I gotta see them all before I can even make that claim, but, or that opinion. But I, I wouldn't say this is, I think, my personal least favorite Anthony Hopkins f performance because I overall enjoy the film overall. And sometimes when I overall enjoy a film, it kind of gives it a little bit more leeway. But sometimes, you know, when I'm watching a really good movie, but the performance is like a really bad standout, I'll be like, yeah, that's probably the worst performance in the entire movie. I've done that several times too. But I, I, I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, this is a movie I'd upgrade to 4K. I'm not even going to lie. I, I really enjoyed it that much. It's like, no, no, no. You you came out with the cat and hat, man. No, that you had worse. I think it wasn't even the, no, the Lorax was Illumination, wasn't it? It might have been also Universal. And the Lorax, I feel like, is a worse movie than this one. Yeah, I said it. I didn't like the Lorax much. Throughout them all, you see the passion by Benicio Del Toro, who not only plays Lawrence Talbot, but was also a producer who helped develop the film. Del Toro, a huge Wolfman fan, is basically the reason this movie was made, since he stuck by it through multiple writers and directors. Mark Romanek was attached as director for a year before leaving over creative differences. He said he wanted to make a more artistic movie than the studio was asking for. Joe Johnston mm. was hired a mere three weeks before production production began, which is cutting it insanely close. Johnston was more of an effects and action-y guy, having directed Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Jumanji, and Captain Jurassic America, Park 3. Right? The year after Wolfman, he'd direct the first Captain America. Yeah, Makeup yeah, effects yeah. were done by Rick Baker, one of the most prestigious artists in his field. It was Jack Pierce's work on the Wolfman and other Universal Monster films that first made Baker want to be an effects artist. In 1981, Baker created Comes full the circle. most famous werewolf transformation sequence in an American werewolf in London. Thanks to Del Toro, Johnston, and Baker, The Wolfman 2010 is a gothic, gory roller coaster with a well-done Victorian atmosphere. Despite its faults, I'm not surprised to learn it's been having a bit of a reappraisal lately. If you're into werewolves, you could do a lot worse than this remake that was oh. clearly made with love. How many villains? But uh, look, at least he acknowledged that. At least James acknowledged that. You could tell there was a lot of time and effort put into this movie. It wasn't just a big shit show cash grab they just do together. It wasn't that. It, it was. You could tell the, the the a lot of fucking passion went behind the the makeup, the the visuals, the effects. I mean, you, you could tell everything that they put into this thing. And man, even that alone is is praiseworthy. Uh, yeah, when it comes to werewolf movies, I've seen some pretty bad werewolf movies. This is by far not even close to the bottom of the barrel, in my personal opinion. I mean, come on now. Like, it really isn't all that bad. It has its ups. It has its major ups. And again, I love the way the Wolfman looks in this movie. I think he looks fucking top notch. And uh, look, I honestly, honestly, this is that the fact that he just mentioned this. I feel like if they went the artsy way, it would have done better. I, I so believe that now because an artsy film, I'd love to see A24 get a hold of a Universal Monster Project. That would be insane. I think The Wolfman would be a lot of fun to see that. Yeah, I'd be down, I'd been down for that, man. I think going with um, Johnson as the director was a big mistake, actually, because, yeah, I'm not a big fan of the guy's work. Jurassic Park 3 was a meh movie to me. It's, it's fine. It's passable. It's not like the worst thing I've ever seen in my life, but no. Uh, I feel like they've always wanted to go with an action style, though, for the, the Universal Monster stuff, which really annoys the fuck out of me. I'm sorry. No, please don't. I, I, I feel like they've tried to dive more into the action side of the Universal Monster stuff, which, you know, the two th like the 1990s, The Mummy, did exceptionally well with it, but it also knew exactly what it was still. It was still a horror film. Yeah. Will we see get turned into dog treats? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins with Kurt Seodmach's werewolf poem from the original. Even a man who is pure of heart and says his prayers by night may become a wolf when the wolf's bane blooms and the autumn moon is bright. It's 1891 in Blackmore, England, and little dead riding hood Ben Talbot just found a big bad wolf in the woods. A couple of bloody claw swipes shows us this ain't your grandma's wolfman movie, and this ain't your grandma's wolfman title card, because it's one word now. Ben's disappearance causes his brother, Lawrence Talbot, to return to their home of Talbot Hall, which is about 80% soot. I like how much Benicio Del Toro resembles Lon Chaney Jr. Yeah, he, he does, yeah. He Lawrence, who's lived most of his life in the U.S. as a Shakespearean actor. He reunites with his father, Sir John Talbot, 
Talbot, played by everyone's favorite cannibal, Anthony Hopkins. Ah. Lo and behold, the prodigal son returns. This remake changes Sir John from a slightly overbearing father into an emotionally abusive guy who can barely contain his contempt for his son. Like, watch where you're pointing that barrel, Pops! Lawrence wants to help search for his brother, but a half-acted Sir John tells him it's too late. Unfortunately, your brother's body was found in a ditch by the Priory Road. Uh, yesterday morning. Apparently the studio saw footage of Anthony Hopkins and asked why he wasn't, quote, doing anything. Johnston told them the performance might work better in the edit. It didn't, and I think Johnston is aware. And as you're watching, you go, wow, what was that? What, what was he doing there? That was sort of strange. To see his brother's body, Larry rides into the nearby village, which was played by the village of Castle Coombe in Wiltshire. Castle Coombe is one of many excellent settings for the Wolfman, since it's a real-life period town with no modern touches to it. I want to say, and I know, I, again, I keep pausing it, but like, there's a lot to talk about with this film that I love to get my opinions out on is that, and I don't want to talk over the video because that's rude, <laughs> but dude, I don't know if Anthony Hopkins was like, I, I just don't feel like he's the actor to like fucking half-ass a role. You know what I mean? I feel like maybe he was trying to tap into something and everybody just misunderstood what he was trying to tap into. That's kind of where I'm getting at. I don't, I don't think he would just fuck fuck the movie over because you know he's just in a bad mood or anything like that or he just doesn't care I, that's not really and you know i know anthony hopkins has taken more smaller budget stuff now because he just wants to make a paycheck but at the time i, I just don't see him fucking this over for for that, a, a, a reason like that you know i could be wrong i could be wrong maybe i'm just not seeing a side of anthony hopkins that i'm just not seeing but it doesn't come off like the guy i think i think he was just trying to do something and everybody just kind of misunderstood maybe it just wasn't right for the movie overall Maybe he just didn't get the feel of it. I, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's misunderstood, really. All production had to do to match the era of the film was cover up road signs and dirty up some houses. The local butcher has been keeping Ben's body on ice, and even though he's warned not to, Larry takes a peek. Holy walking dead! Yeah, maybe make this a closed casket funeral. He, he got by the pub up. for a pint, where some gossiping locals mention how two other men were killed My in mother similar wasn't attacks. But we never met him, so doesn't count. Pub owner Mr. Kirk blames a local Romani camp and its dancing bear, but Local rambler McQueen posits the presence of a werewolf. Whatever did he was big, had claws, and didn't mind a load of bookshot. Great Quint-like monologue here by Scottish actor Clive Russell, aka the motherfucking Blackfish. Larry returns home to check on remake Gwen Conlon, who wrote to him about Ben's disappearance in the first place. Gwen is now Ben's fiance, or ex-fiance, I guess, meaning this remake has no need for Frank the Wank. She's currently staying at Talbot Hall with her ironborn maid. Hell yeah, Game of Thrones actors! Lawrence and Gwen meet face to face for the first time, and he pledges to remain in England and find out what happened to Ben. The death weighs heavily on both of them, and it doesn't help when Larry. Oh, Wow. The door into the house's flash. Her name's not coming to my mind right away, but dude, uh, fantastic actress. Quiet Place. I mean, I, I totally forgot she was even in this for a second. Oh my goodness. God, that's going to bother me what her name is. Please comment down below in the comments. I'm not going to look it up, but comment down below in the comment what her name is. Uh, I, it's on the tip of my tongue. Back room. Come on, Lair Lair, stay in the present. No time to think back to those Donald Duck races. He remembers a night when his brother was a young Ace of She He probably mentioned it. I just. Wake up. Oh shit, we ghosted! Larry the Tiny Talbot left Ben and wandered the grounds alone that night, trying to beat his previous best record in they a find time his mom, yeah. race. Larry came upon his mother, Solana, dead from an apparent suicide with a straight razor. He found her in his father's arms, who sent Lawrence to an asylum for a year and then off to the United States. Rough history between them, but maybe they can bond over a telescope like in the original. Bonus points, this one's not pointed at the bedroom window of the love interest. Ben's belongings from the butcher include a mysterious medallion, which Lawrence traces to a nearby Romani camp, all while the full moon hunts him like this were Moonfall. He's sent to see the fortune teller Maliva, played here by the tramp's daughter Geraldine Chaplin. She was Iris the Nanny in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. He begins to ask her about his wow. brother when a classic pitchfork mob arrives. They're here to nab themselves a dancing bear pelt, blaming the recent deaths on this poor ursine entertainer. Before this silly Bobby, Constable Nye, can get things under control, the killing begins, starting with a guy played by Rick Baker in a cameo, who gets tackled and snackled on off screen. 
Dream. Alongside makeup supervisor Dave Elsie, Baker won the Best Makeup Oscar for his work on this film. Fitting, since he won the first ever Best Makeup Oscar for his work on an American werewolf in London. The stealth werewolf infiltrates the camp, turning this rando into lasagna in the middle of a crowd. The whole camp erupts into a panic, and several Fucking people hell. lose limbs, but not their lives, as far as counting goes. In the chaos, Mr. Kirk accidentally shoots a passing shadow puppeteer, then is attacked and killed by a pair of hairy hands. Constable Nye finds another dead body in a nearby wagon, but a pulse check causes him to lose a couple of fingers. The beast then claws him through the jaw and out the mouth! God damn! Maybe check for a first aid kit while you're in there, dude. Lawrence arrives, saves <laughs> a woman, and grabs a rifle from a dead body on the ground. Too bad, just like in the original, his wolf targeting ain't shit. He decides to pursue the beast into this Stonehenge-looking clearing. Hope he doesn't run into Connell to be on his fa to be fair, dude, that thing moves at like an unreasonable, unreasonable speed. Dude, did you see how he tackled that first victim? Like, dude, it was like you almost didn't even see it happen. To be on his side and fair. Uh, that thing was like super fast. <laughs> Cochran. Oh, you know what? This is actually probably worse. The creature takes a big old chunk of Larry out of his neck before he's rescued and taken back to Maliva, who nurses him back to health. While others there want to put this dangerous dog down, Maliva thinks that's the owner's decision. He can only be released by someone who loves him. Hope you ain't talking about Sir John Maliva, or else our boy Lawrence is screwed. They overnight ship him back to Talbot that hurts, Hall, man. where Larry oh. exhibits symptoms like speed ramping. He also experiences some light sparkle hallucinations and a bad case of boneritis. <laughs> Oh shit, and a visit from train spotting Gollum? When he wakes up from his fever dreams, family physician Dr. Lloyd discovers his wounds have healed at a remarkable rate. It's one of the few scenes lifted directly from the original, though remake Lloyd doesn't engage in PJ Peekaboo. Does prescribe him some Gatorade Frost though. The strange events finally catch mm. the attention of Scotland Yard, who send over Mr. Smith to take care of the situation. Hugo Weaving is playing Francis Aberline, a character inspired by Frederick Aberline, the real life inspector who tried to catch Jack the Ripper. That real life background is applied to the fictional Francis. Weren't you in charge of the Ripper case a couple years back? Aberline voices a suspicion towards Larry due to his history of mental illness, but the only thing we learn from this scene is that Hugo Weaving's the only one giving an interesting performance. Larry goes out to the lake where he questions his sanity. He's a, yep, he does still great, screwy. Yeah. He's joined by his dead brother Zex, taking a break from subbing for and dressing like Miss Peregrine. Remake Gwen Conliffe is played by Emily Blunt, last seen on the kill count in both Quiet Play. Thank you, Emily Blunt. Thank you. That was gonna kill me. Places. I like Blunt a lot, but does she get anything to do in this movie? No. Lawrence gives her a flirtatious rock throwing lesson, and pretty soon she's sending them jungle cruising across the lake. It's kind of father sunny for a first date, but you know what? These two don't have any actual romantic chemistry, so whatever. Also, Larry could use a loving father relationship. His developing dog ears discern a distant din. He returns home to find the hat brigade here to arrest him. Here's a hat, and another hat. The hats get stupider in every shot. Hatting it up are local landowner Squire Strickland and this movie's Colonel Monfort, looking more like Colonel mustard to me. They've heard rumors of Larry's Dead. werewolf bite and want to capture him for safekeeping, but they're stopped by a gunshot from a tired old man. Sorry, Colonel. I meant to shoot you. Sadly, I'm not the marksman I used to be. Okay, that was actually kind of baller. You win this one, Tony. <laughs> they can go on and get. Gwen dismisses the townsfolk's fears as backwards and old-fashioned, but Larry's super healing convinces him they might have a point. Also not- you see, it's moments like that that make me like really kind of love the charm of that character. Just, oh, sorry, Colonel. I meant to shoot you. <laughs> Just Not a good that sign shit. that he's going gaga over Gwen's décolletage. He visits Singh, his father's loyal servant, who tends to the estate in between dates with Steed Bonnet. Singh tells Lawrence his family is cursed and shows him a stash of silver bullets. When you need those as a safety plan, might be a good idea to send the love interest away. Lawrence tells Gwen she can't wait until the edge of tomorrow. She has to return to London now so she can be safe from him. I see what you did there, the edge of tomorrow. Wow, man. And hey, Funny. If it keeps her from being in this movie for the next 30 minutes? Good for her. The town prepares for the upcoming full moon with many a swing of the hammer. Aberline swings by the pub so we can get some good acting as a doggy treat. Rules, Mrs. Kirk. They're all that keep us from a dog eat dog world, you know. At Talbot Hall, Lawrence notices his father going out for a midnight stroll. He follows him mm, to a crib, yeah. which we saw this Brother Ben moment. running towards in the movie's opening. Inside, Lawrence finds a shrine to his dead mother, as well as a lazy boy that only dads are allowed to sit in. Speaking of the Popkins, Anthony Hopkins popkins in to explain his performance. You see, I'm quite dead. <laughs> <laughs> 
He escorts Lawrence out and closes the door behind him, locking himself inside so he can twinkle his eyes in peace. Lawrence starts getting his dog on, his joints elongating in a painful looking transformation, clearly inspired by Baker's seminal work in An American Werewolf in London. This first transformation is hidden in shadows and reflections. They wanted to save the full reveal for later. It still required reshoots to help flesh it out, meaning the effects team had to combine shots that were filmed months apart. Baby's first howls are heard by Aberline back in town, so he hightails it into the woods. Wolfman Larry evil deads his way towards some bait and falls into a pit trap set by the townsfolk. The men rush to inspect it, but one poor soul, Johnny, loses Great his scene. step and tumbles in, quickly earning a slash to the face and a five-finger death stuff. punch through the stomach. Ooh, and a kid? Oh, no, not a kid. McQueen tries to take aim, but Wolfie Boy yanks him into the party pit. In a darkly comedic kill, he dismembers McQueen and tosses his still-firing gun arm back up to his friends. He pops up out of the hole and two more shooters are killed. This one local, who takes some friendly fire, and Squire Strickland, who's Freddy vs. Jason flying into a wall. Lawrence <laughs> wraps up this attack by killing two legacy characters from the original. First on the menu is no Colonel Monk, no who gets stuck in some marsh muck before Larry knocks his block off with a claw swipe. Next up is Dr. Lloyd, who's attacked and killed off screen, as Aberline gets to this Elden Ring looking place and discovers the leftover carnage. I don't mind that these two characters, who kind of come from the original, are killed. Like I said during that movie's That's kill awesome. count, they weren't anything special to begin with. What was special was Jack Pierce's Wolfman makeup on Lon Chaney Jr., and both Rick Baker and Benicio Del Toro wanted to pay homage to it. After designing a face that was similar, but not too similar, to the OG version, Baker did what he's done since childhood and tested the makeup on himself. I like doing that because I like to see what it's like on the other side. Eventually, it was Del Toro's turn. The actor got a whole body life cast out of alginate, the same stuff used for teeth molds at the dentist. Every body part was sculpted into a prosthetic, which then needed to be painted and fitted with hair. The hair was a whole operation. Teams of 20 people oh, would no punch doubt. hair into the spandex suit and foam pieces, individually knotting them strand by strand. Four different shades of yak hair were used, along with finer human hair and even finer wolf hair, to give the fur a nice gradation of thickness. This fur suit is a work of art, and I'm glad it Baker really was able to get it made. The production manager called me into the office once and said, what, what is this? Why are you buy, buying all this hair? What is this hair for? I go, seriously? Why do you need this hair? And he had a big, behind his desk, he had a big sign that said, Wolf Man. To mimic the way Lon Chaney walked in the original, effects supervisor Dave Elsie suggested leg extensions. They used prosthetics designed for people who are missing limbs. Finally, the Wolf Man face was built up in the usual arduous process, which took between four and five hours to apply. Del Toro seemed totally fine with it, though. I'm telling you, he was into this role. Like, yeah, really, he really was. You. Larry wakes up the next morning in a trunk bed, looking a little worse for Werewolf. Sir John chastises him with glee. Hey! If you're gonna go, if you're gonna do it, man, you gotta go all the way. You know what I mean? You gotta go all the way. If you're gonna be that wolf man, do it. Terrible things, Lawrence. You've done terrible things. Well, maybe I just need a dad who loves me! Since he didn't renew his license to kill, Larry is arrested by Aberline's men with a violent gun punch on the grounds of Talbot Hall. The Talbot home is played by the historic Chatsworth house in Derbyshire. They were supposed to have nine weeks to shoot at Chatsworth, but thanks to scheduling issues, only had one. That is not a ton of time for all the stuff they had to film there. Lawrence is sent back to Lambeth Asylum in London, where his father sent him as a child after he discovered the death of his mother. He's reunited with Dr. Henniger, who treated him in his youth and who oozes with evil doctor vibes. We have made enormous strides in the treatment of delusions. His father I fucked him over bad. Those strides include riffraff waterboarding Lawrence to rid him of his werewolf delusions. All the Arctic Enema does, though, is give him hallucinations of headless hamlets and haunted mansion statues. Whoa, and some very poppin' side boob. He awakens from this Bosler manian nightmare to find his father paying a family visit. Sir John reveals that his glowy eyes were because he's a werewolf too. He he became one during a hunting trip in Tibet, where he was bitten by a were golem. This werewolf boy from Tibet origin was inspired by 1935's Werewolf of London, that lesser known werewolf prototype film that I have yet to see. After his return, I Sir John accidentally killed his wife during his first transformation. It's a memory little Lawrence had suppressed, probably with the help of Dr. Henniger, but now he remembers. You killed my mother. Yes, I, I did. did. With this reveal, Lawrence tries to get himself banned from Xbox Live. You should kill yourself. 
He only gets angrier when he finds out his father also unintentionally killed Ben. Though that may have been a subconscious murder, since Sir John was falling in love with Gwen? Wait, what the fuck? That motivation is revealed in this scene and then never really brought up again. Seems dumb. Up until recently, Sam yeah, had been locking Sir John in the crypt every full moon for safety. That's why the dad chair looked a little kinky. But the elder Talbot is done restraining himself. I should have let it run free. A kill or be killed. He leaves Larry locked in his cell, playing the prison harmonica on his way out. <laughs> What a Hannah Baller. And that was actually Hopkins' idea. I don't know, must have had his coffee that day. The next full moon, Dr. Henniger wheels Lawrence out to experience the Nick at night. He's going to expose him to the full moon directly, hoping it'll break him of his delusions. Lawrence just yells that they're putting themselves in danger and ends up sounding like the doctor in Too Many Cooks. Kill me. In the deep Kill me. They don't. And while Henniger prattles on, Lawrence goes through another transformation scene. Whereas the first transformation took place in the shadows, this one is completely illuminated to show off the effects. In fact, they designed this one first, knowing it'd be the much more difficult task. We figured right. if we can pull off a transformation in a brightly lit room, full on manned animal, we can do anything. Rick Baker wanted the transformation to be more practical, updating the techniques he had used nearly 30 years prior. But Johnston was hired too close to production to comfortably sign off on how it would look. The director decided on using a CG transformation so they would have more flexibility and time to mess with it in post. Thankfully, he had a talented post team headed by VFX supervisor Steven Begg and VFX producer Karen Murphy. Those prosthetics made from the life casts were 3D scanned into a computer which was also done with Del Toro's full body using a larger high-resolution scanner. This gave them a basis for their digital effects, which distorted features of the face and body as they transitioned from Lawrence Talbot to the Wolfman makeup done by Rick Baker. Digital Facility MPC used a proprietary software called Fertility for the hair growth during the transition, one of the more difficult things to do digitally. Yeah. Sure, not every shot is great, but no, overall, no. I don't hate the CG, and when it's over, we get an awesome practical Wolfman. The CG, no, the CG is not horrible. I, I'd prefer the uh, practical effects. I feel like that would have been more, you know, it would have been, it would, it would have felt more authentic, uh, uh, authentic. Um, but the, it wasn't a bad transformation scene at all. It, it wasn't. It, it's just, it, you know, when you, especially, uh, yeah, you see, they showed the, you know, the worst CGI where you're just like, that, that shit's pretty bad looking. But, you no, know, it, it turned out pretty good. A stupidly yeah. heroic orderly tries to sedate the newly transformed Talbot, but the Wolfman quickly overpowers him and extracts a pound of flesh from his belly. He moves on to Dr. Henniger next, whom he throws out the window down onto a spiked gate. Always feels good to land those stage fatalities. Larry escapes <laughs> onto the rooftops of Victorian London, rendered here in all its dark and glory. He finishes singing out there and howls at the moon. <laughs> The Wolfman's howls used samples from several rock vocalists, including Van Halen's really? David Lee Roth and Kiss's Gene Simmons. Aberline pursues Larry as he tries to escape. Hope all these buildings have roof insurance, I tell you what. The furry fiend Goomba stomps one unsuspecting policeman, then runs into the town square in tribute to the Piccadilly Circus scene from the end of An American Werewolf in London. Larry dodges a steam-powered double-decker, which crushes a fleeing pedestrian. Hey, Jeez. asshole, right of way! The bus tips over, allowing Larry to bust in and carve up four passengers inside with various claw slashes and swipes. This entire badass action sequence was an amazing merger of practical and digital effects. Oh, it yeah. started with Henniger's I agree. kill, where a stunt performer was thrown through a window onto a crash pad. That shot cuts to an actual human doing a wire stunt, which transitions into CG at the bottom of his fall, where he's impaled with some CG spikes. The end of his death cuts back to the real actor, with the digital spikes coming out of his back. On the rooftops, we see a collaboration between the visual effects team and Del Toro's main Wolfman stunt double, the aptly named Spencer Wilding, whose first credit was also as a werewolf in Prisoner of Azkaban. This dude did a Kidding. ton of cool shit for the Wolfman. My favorite is when he was on a carpet being pulled at 20 miles per hour to make his running look faster. They compared it to the moving walk at That's airports. That's dope. But Wilding was wilding out all over the place, hanging from cables and using a rig around his waist to allow him to run on all fours. This was a huge part of reshoots. Initially, the Wolfman only ran around on 
on two legs. But they thought it looked bad, so they went back and made him part quadrupedal. I figured cool, it was the cool. right call. It was, Wildling it was, was you're right. was running in front of a green screen, interacting with practical props. They called it semi-werewolf parkour. Those shots go, were composited into a digital London, which mixed 3D elements with 2D images for the distant backgrounds. And lest you think that Goomba Stomp was digital, nah man, they really did that shit! After three days of rehearsals, Wilding jumped from an 80-foot roof off of Old Royal Naval College in Greenwich. Uh, I, I just gotta let this footage play out because it's fucking awesome, dude. And it also looks like a lot of fun to do. Yeah, it Finally, does. It's the pretty cool. attack was filmed on the Naval College grounds, keeping it safe from the public since there was so much action involved. There's a lot of people in a small area with carriages going over and action going on, so we all have to have a wits about us. A whole bunch of stunt performers had to take an actual fall from a five and a half ton steam bus. It's a testament to their talents and stunt coordinator Steve Dent that no one got hurt doing these things. Lawrence hurdles his way over ye oldie police barricade and escapes into the night. That must have been crazy. I mean, I watched it, just watched the guy on the bike just duck underneath the camera as it was like panning over to the action. Man, that, that must have been so stressful, you know, just don't hit the camera. Whatever you do, just go underneath it, you know, go as slow as possible, just go underneath the camera. Don't get hit by the camera. And because, you know, that kid, that's an expensive ass camera. But uh, dude, everything that happened there and that's that's great. No one got hurt while filming that because, man, there was a lot of chaos going over and people were just probably wanting to get the scene done and do it right and everything. Man, that would have been so much fun to watch and like to be on set and just watch go down like the Wolfman just tearing up the streets of London. Fuck, that been awesome. He eventually collapses near a bridge where he sleeps off the fur and claws. He reunites with Gwen in her father's antique shop, another nice subtle nod to the original. He fills her in on the film's second act. I'm a monster, and so is my father. He killed Ben. Careful, man. Don't throw her for a looper. Larry's accepted that there's no cure for his condition. It's a part of him now, an inherent vice. But the least he can do is go kill his wolfy dad. Gwen tries to get him to stay with some passionate Raimi romance, but they're interrupted by Aberline, who's here with the latest news. <laughs> Dozens, not by my count. Talbot escapes before Aberline can find him, and hikes past London's smog farms and through Middle Earth to return to Talbot Hall. His girl on the train rushes to meet him there, but after arriving in Blackmore, she's approached by Maliva, who tells her there's only one way to cure a werewolf. Will you condemn Kill him? Kill him. Or will you set him free? Gwen doesn't know if she can bring herself to kill Lawrence, so good thing there's a carriage full of cops who are more than willing. The line is kind of framed as a villain. I wonder, we're going to go back to that really quick and see if that was just a malfunction on my computer. Cops who are more than willing. No, that must have been a copyright issue right there. Dude, that's a shame. He might have had just to remove the audio. And probably with the music, the background music was probably getting copyright claimed. kind of framed as a villain. Universal men are very strict when it comes to fucking free use and stuff. Like, they're very strict. They will get you for almost anything. I'm just being honest. Like, I have dealt with Universal Studios plenty of times on my channel. I almost hate even doing reactions to Universal projects because it's just like they will find a way to fucking copyright claim me and block me or whatever they want to do. Like, seriously, they are, they're strict. But honestly, I'm on his side. Lawrence is clearly a danger. Larry yeah. finally makes it back home he needs to be put and down. sings decaying corpse, the servant having been killed by Sir John during a murderous night. Damn, after surviving so many living daylights. He grabs a key off the servant's body and uses it to get the silver bullets, the better to shoot Papa with. He follows piano music to the foyer where he finds the body of an inspector named Carter. Earlier, Aberline had sent him to meet with Sir John. Wolf Dad is tickling the keys and welcomes Lawrence back with his favorite parable. And lo and behold, Oh, there he stands, the prodigal son, for he has returned. Larry prepares to put his old man down, but Sir John reveals he sabotaged the silver ammo long ago. He proceeds to beat Lawrence with a silver-headed wolf cane, a tribute to the walking stick from the original. The director's cut of the Wolfman has a scene where Larry gets this cane from Max von Sydow. It's some of these 17 minutes that were restored for the extended version. I've heard that cut is better, but I haven't watched it yet. I am a little skeptical, since it adds so much time to the movie's first 40 minutes, which are already kind of slow. But who knows, maybe one day I'll dust off the 
cut comparison. The fighting begets a fire in the room, but the real heat of this battle comes from the glow of the full moon. Sir John encourages Larry to embrace his wild side. You're heir to my kingdom, Lawrence. You've always been heir to my kingdom. Embrace it, Lawrence. The power! The unlimited power! Sir John's transformation happens faster and is less visibly painful than Larry. Yeah. The VFX yeah. team reasoned that he'd be more used to the process. He's exactly. at ease with his transformation. He actually enjoys it. Hopkins's final practical makeup looks great. It's amazing how much his eyes shine through. He was actually so excited about the makeup design, he did a life cast before even signing the contract. Getting a life cast and wearing that makeup is no easy task, especially when you're 71 like he was. So Hopkins did care about this movie to some degree. Larry transforms it. No, you see, I, I think I think you, you completely misunderstood. I think he, he did care about the project. I think he was down for it. I mean, the guy literally won an Academy Award for giving one of the best horror performances of all time. I don't think he was... I, I don't think he was meaning to come off like he was not giving a shit. I think that he was trying to do something very unique and different with the character. It's just it came off like he might not have cared. I think... Because the way I preceded the character was he was... He always came off like he was hiding something. He always came off like he just didn't want to be enthusiastic or he didn't want to he didn't want to be himself maybe because he thought that would give too much away about what he is. I always viewed it like that. I didn't really view it like he he didn't give a shit about the performance. He was just trying to just get through it and get a paycheck. No, I, I feel like he genuinely really was enjoying what he was doing. I think it's just a misunderstood performance. I think he actually was he had a he had a he had a mindset going on the set and and it just kind of came off like he was half assing it. But I, I don't think he, I don't think he was. I think he was trying to do something. In turn, so they're ready for an all out Wolfman fight. It's badass. The two battle for the title of Bigger, Badder Wolf in the most 2000s remake scene possible. It's goofy as all hell, but I kind of It's badass. It. it was filmed it's by stunt badass, supervisor Vic Armstrong during the many reshoots that ballooned the budget from 85 to 150 million dollars. The fight, coordinated by C.C. Smith, uses lots of wires which were later removed digitally, with the stunt performers being pulled up to battle in midair. The intensity was a pain when it came to the prosthetics, and many spares had to be made. Sometimes we would we would destroy a pair of hands in, in one take, and uh, that doesn't make me very happy. <laughs> the VFX team was asked no, to add a bunch of blood more. They were more than happy to comply. So many oftentimes in visual effects, we were told to take blood out. This is a film we had a blast with because we could put in as much blood and guts as we wanted to. Sir John initially gets the upper claw, but Lawrence manages to kick him into the nearby fireplace, Lion setting King. him ablaze. Ugh, I hate the smell of burnt hair. So does Larry, so he ends his father's reign with a belly slash and a swipe that takes his head clean off his shoulders. Now that is a well done dog fight. This head effect was built on footage of Hopkins in front of a green screen. It's funny how he seemed to care most about this movie's effects. Gwen arrives to discover Larry in full beast mode. Aberline's right behind her, so Larry attacks and bites the cop with a vendetta. A spear toss gives Gwen a window to escape. Ah, who throws a spear? Honestly! Larry would rather chase a pretty lady than play speary swipey with Aberline, so he Texas Chainsaw final girls out a window to pursue. Gwen makes her way into the woods, but can't outrun Larry, who corners her by a waterfall. She makes a desperate appeal to his inner humanity. Lawrence, you know me. You know me. Remember me. Look at me. It works long enough for her to shoot him through the chest. Oh, damn, yeah. You go, girl. Yeah. Harry Larry reverts back to his slightly less hairy human form and thanks Gwen before dying in her arms. Don't worry, though. You'll be fine. All dogs go to heaven. The townsfolk <laughs> catch up, and Aberline realizes with horror that, thanks to Larry's bike, he's doomed to bear the Talbot curse. The movie ends as Talbot Hall burns to the ground, and we're treated to one last howl for the road. Consider it a doggy bag. How I many love the people credits. drop dead? Man, if you have to give the best kill, I, I think you'd have to go with the, the, probably Anthony Hopkins. Probably. I. Either Anthony Hopkins or the fucking finger, like through the, through the neck. I thought that was a really cool kill too. Wolfman dropped that space in his name? Let's find out and... <laughs> Twenty-eight people died in the Wolfman. Holy shit! Seven times the amount in the original. The victims consisted of twenty-six dudes and two ladies. I guess the Wolfman likes his meat pies manly. Breaking the kills down by culprit, Sir John killed twelve people, Lawrence fifteen if you include the guy who got run over, and Gwen secured the last kill by shooting Lawrence. You'd probably have to give the worst kill to the mom, probably because it was off-screen. Yeah, yeah. 
With a runtime of 102 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 3.64 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Constable Nye. I think this one gets a gasp out yeah. of everyone when they first it's see cool. it. It's cool. Machete for lamest kill will go to Inspector Carter, since I didn't even know who he was when we saw that's the right. body. And that's it. The Wolfman was released in 2010, and plans for another reboot with Ryan Gosling seem to peter out after Tom Cruise's The Mummy. Maybe we'll see Lawrence Talbot again someday, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been, this the, been kill the kill count. count. Oh, the next. Okay, so yeah, no, look, look, I agree with that. I agree. That, that was pretty good. I actually had a yeah, constable makes sense, but the other guy, the other guy, uh, yeah, I, I, I totally forgot he was in, even in the movie. So yeah, that's that's perfect. Yeah, kill for the most dullest kill on the kill count. Wow, this video has been going for fucking 40 minutes, guys. Comment down below. Let me know your thoughts. What was your favorite and least favorite kill of The Wolfman 2010? Did you guys enjoy this movie? Did you not enjoy it? Let me know in the re comments down below why you didn't enjoy it or why you enjoyed it. So uh, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel for new channel, share the content. It does mean a lot. And until next time, guys, do keep it retro and do take care.